Okay, folks. Thank you, thank you, thank you for coming. It's Monday, and I know people are getting ready to bug out and all that stuff. I, you know, my, my site's packed up except for the tent, and I'm hoping it dries out in a couple minutes. But um, I'm excited about doing this because last time I did, which was three years ago, it was a talk with slides. Now that we have good you know, fiber connection all the way up in here, um, I can go ahead and do a live demo. So I thought my only risk coming up is if the link went down. Uh, but I was telling Guy yesterday, we were walking around a little bit. Um, this site was built kind of out of my own curiosity and some people I knew in the astronomy department up at Penn State where I'd gone to school. I, I didn't, uh, I didn't attend, uh, I wasn't part of the, the astronomy program there. But I uh, talked with them and they, were, they have a very good graduate program and they were one of the uh, schools were on a team of a number of folks with NASA on a satellite program called SWIFT which detects high energy transients and was designed specifically to track gamma ray bursts. So that's kind of how I got into it. So I built this on a Yahoo group, and I got some help from uh, folks over at um, NASA. Got it up in you know Greenbelt, and um, they're the principal investigators' office there. They're very open. And it seems like NASA is. They're very open to the public in terms of people who want to learn about these things, as they are with many of the different programs that they sponsor out of, out of that agency. So they agreed very quickly to allow uh, me through this site to downlink uh, telemetry coming down from the satellite that detects these bursts. <clears throat> and then there's a whole other network of people, it's just all internet connected, all over the world that may take ground observations if there's something to be seen in visual uh, spectrum or infrared typically is what they look at. But I've seen everything from another gamma ray uh, or, or gamma particle detector on a spacecraft all the way down to radio at uh, you know VLA and some of the other different NRAO sites uh, if they think there's a radio counterpart that sort of thing so uh, the uh, I'd set this up on Yahoo groups and it was perking along just fine about four or five weeks ago I went through everything just making sure all the links were up to date because sometimes they change <laughs> and I had all that done and Labor Day weekend, my folks were visiting, and uh, Yahoo, without warning, had decided to change their whole interface. So if any of you had, if any of you were on Yahoo and saw that, you know, I'm scrambling all over the place. My folks are visiting, and I'm on, I'm, you know, messing around with this, trying to make sure everything works, and um, got it there eventually. But there's still some quirks in it, so I had to, I had changed the whole um, layout for this. I can show you what it used to look like. This was the uh, this was the original site. It's been up for years since I opened it up in 2006. And Yahoo kept a nice table at the bottom there that shows how many messages are coming through on a monthly basis. And I could go to any one of those and pick up what was happening in February of 2009, for example. But it started in 2006, I guess, in April. Um, I had some downtime here in June and July of 2010 because I was doing some changes to it, and I stopped the communication features. And then picked it right up again. So, uh, and we got through August, and now we're in Labor Day. I don't have any other tracking for it. So, I, I was really happy with that site. It, it was very simple. It, it did what I wanted it to do. And, um, but now everything changed, and it looks like this. So I put a new picture on there. Uh, so there, there are two uh, basic features of this running on on Yahoo that were attractive. And again, and again this was just to satisfy my own curiosity. These messages here below are either telemetry coming right down from the SWIFT satellite or some comment from a ground uh, location saying, you know, we've, um, we image this in the infrared spectrum and here are, they'll give, them the, they'll give you the light curve. They won't actually plot the light curve, but they'll show what type of magnitude they were looking at. And what's important is this changes over time and very quickly. So the burst might happen and within the first uh, couple hours it's maybe it's bright enough to observe from Earth and, and what's important is many times it's not observable at all. You get a gamma ray detection but you don't, uh, or gamma particle detection, but you don't get um, any visual or infrared component to it. But when they do, um, they'll put a scope on it and they'll take a look in different um, infrared filters or visual filters and then they'll publish to this group the type of scope they were using and the magnitude they observed um, over the time period they look. Maybe they come back a day later. I mean, this is all a function of whether it's clear at TMI or sunny in, you know, south, uh, southeastern Australia, that sort of thing for people to go look. So that's the primary feature. And as we get on through this, I'll, I'll show it to you. 
you know with astronomy, you know, those of you who've done imaging or, or looked at this stuff in any, any kind of detail, a lot of it's like watching paint dry, so you have to be really, really patient. And, uh, you know, I've, I've learned a lot over the last five or six years, but it's basically what's been coming off of these, um, these notices that come across and the discussion about what they're observing. The other primary feature, and it used to be easier to get to, the other primary feature is um, a group of links I put together for it. And I skinnied this down, but essentially, when I thought about it here when I was updating everything a month ago, I'm like, okay, what did I do with this originally and what is it now? And originally it was to satisfy my own curiosity and, and still is, um, but I try to develop it now so it's more or less a learning portal. So these are organized um, so that if you're just new to looking at this stuff, which most people, most people are, uh, you can go in here and, and get a little educated about it. Um, I started off very basic with what NASA put on their site. They have these Imagine the Universe um, discussions on just about anything you can think of that NASA uh, traces. You can start with that. There's one that's, uh, that's very basic. There's one that's a little more uh, specific. A little slow up here. Yeah, it's a little slow. Um, this is a little more technical. Uh, this one I thought was pretty good from the Encyclopedia of Science. Um, it tells you basically, if you look at these and what they are, um, there's essentially, and I had a professor tell me this, we've never been to one of these, so we can't tell for sure what they are, but what we think is happening here is you've got a couple of different um, presentations. And you know how scientists like to put everything in categories, so like they do stars and, and uh, like they do with uh, nebula and, and uh, galaxy formation, things of that nature. The long gamma ray burst, and I'll show you the light curve, is thought to be a star that's more or less imploded. And the reason we even see these, um, a lot are believed to be, does it, has anyone ever studied Wolf Riot stars? Looked at that? Yeah. Um, a lot of them are thought to be that type of star. But if, essentially, these have happened a long time ago. And you're looking more or less back in time, not so much you know, what you're observing relatively um, recently in our own galaxy. These are extragalactic and go way, way back. Um, but those jets coming out of the top and the bottom are because the star is, is collapsing, it starts to spin faster, and the weak point of all, that, uh, of all that mass is at the poles because you've got this surface tension for the star while it's rotating. And when it collapses, these jets appear uh, based on what's left in the nucleus with what's going on. So, and it blows its um, outer shells away a lot like a nova would, would do, a supernova. And when you get that type of activity when it's detected by um, a satellite around Earth. It, these more, it's, a light, it's like a lighthouse beacon. You've more, basically got to be in line with the, the sight of it in order to see it. And sometimes you just get the gamma particle radiation, and sometimes you go, um, when they go take a look at it on the ground and take spectra of it, they pick up magnesium, they pick up carbon, they pick up iron, they pick up uh, hydrogen, different forms, you know, higher energy than neutral hydrogen, that sort of thing. And they report all this stuff through the circulars network to the whole community. Now, they may keep this stuff on their own, do their own studies, but part of the uh, participation of the whole astronomical community is to just take their basic observation and put it out there for everybody else to see and to look at. So um, when I show you how these, these bursts occur in the light curve for them, this, this is considered a long gamma ray burst, two seconds or longer. A short burst is reckoned to be uh, the possibility of two neutron stars that were surrounding each other. They're a binary pair. And because of the gravity of it, they uh, get in a situation where they're collapsing on the, on the two of them. And when they merge, more or less, you create the same sort of, um, same sort of effect where you've got the uh, nuclear energy of those two systems uh, producing jets that come out of the top and bottom. OK, so those are the two primary, if you want to go look at what they are, and there's history in here of, of uh, when they were first detected. <clears throat> a lot of, uh, well, let me tell folks this, they were detected like a lot of things are by accident. You remember the Big Bang was detected by AT&T when they were putting up microwave towers and they couldn't, they couldn't figure out where all this hiss was coming from in the background. And um, in this particular sense, back when we had um, the, uh, the Cold War, uh, the Russians and the Americans put up satellites to detect gamma ray radiation from the ground just to make sure, I'm sorry I got my back to you guys, 
um, just to make sure that um, you know the Soviets were making sure that we, we weren't doing a ground test and we were making sure they weren't doing a ground test. It was all one of those things. And these satellites at random from all over the sky started picking up these, they were designed to pick up gamma particles and, and they were getting these, you know, these uh, detections. And there was all kinds of uh, speculation going around. You know, the Americans believed for a period of time that maybe the Soviets had a test site on the dark side of the moon. I mean, are they, serious? they were seriously considering that. But essentially what they decided, it was something scientific that really hadn't been, been looked at much or, or um, studied much before. And uh, we're also in the process uh, through NASA and through some international programs of putting up satellites to detect high energy uh, uh, items also like radiation you get from a, an ultraviolet source or an X-ray source from a galaxy or another star. Um, and they were designed at the time to start picking this up also. The first satellite dedicated to go and look at this was SWIFT. And um, I can tell you a little bit about SWIFT through these links. It's, you know, the, the whole point of the, the learning objective. If they'll come up here. This is another Yahoo gotcha thing. Anybody know how much bandwidth we get up here? Has anybody checked? How much bandwidth are we getting up here? There should be enough for the It's all slower at home, so. <clears throat> I don't have an Ethernet cord, but there's one in here. All right, so here's. Um, Here's something I want to show you about. The, these are links for um, some of the space programs. I could go into that folder and a few things are listed individually. But those of you who know the NASA sites, the um, high energy missions are called HESARC. And you'll see these satellites over here on the left in terms of what they are, what their mission is, what they're designed to do. Uh, this is for SWIFT. And you can, you can see here uh, what the um, purpose of the mission was all about. It was to detect gamma ray bursts as they occur. You know, it's, it's got, uh, it, it, it slews almost immediately to a, a target when they see it. And um, uh, the primary detector on it is called the Burst, uh, burst Alert Telescope. They're flat panel um, semiconductor, uh, complex semiconductor that with a coated lead mask on the top of it that accepts these particles and based on the way the particles are hitting the flat panel, it can decide more or less where the um, location in the sky was that the particles are coming from within maybe a couple arc minutes originally. Uh, then there's an X-ray telescope also on board and a um, visual band, ultraviolet band telescope on board. The X-ray telescope goes and looks at the source um, and can narrow the, down, narrow the uh, field of view in the bullseye down to um, uh, one, one and a half roughly arc seconds. So it gets in there pretty close and, uh, and radios that. This is all happening. The ra it's radioing to the Earth and getting picked up at Goddard where this location is and that gets published all around the world and somebody who wants to go look at it almost immediately um, knows more or less where it is within a few arc seconds. So. You can take a look at a high, high energy observatory through that link. So the thing you'll notice with this after a while is you can really go nuts on this and be drilling, way, you know, drilling in way deep. I usually load it up if I'm spending time with it I'll set my browser up so I get two or three tabs of the home page because sometimes I get so deep into it that I can't back out again. I'll just I'll just scrub it and redo it. Um, but those are the basic uh, those are the basic you know want to learn about it features. What I want to spend some time on is this folder that says be a part of the network because I can show you the telemetry that's coming in and the comments that are being made um, by the astronomical community. These observatories and and high energy programs, um, those, site, le, what, those websites get updated a lot because people who are in that community, it's an education type of, uh, you know, 
presentation for the most part, and they're always kind of tweaking it. So every so often, I have to go in there and, and update it. And, uh, but if you wanted to go and find out what observatories are spending time looking at these, um, these types of transients, you could go here. And uh, the large aperture are the big ones. It's Gemini and, and Keck and, and uh, a lot of those other scopes. These are uh, more interesting to me. And the reason I, um, the way I find them is this chatter that comes in through the link at Goddard will list what telescope looked at it, what group was looking at it, and what have you. So, um, and then divide them up into Western and Eastern. You see some of these you may recognize. Raptor is a group of telescopes over at uh, Los Alamos. Sees wide fields, sees pretty much the whole sky. There's some robotic telescopes to look at. I'm going to show you here as an outreach um, program in a little while. These prompt telescopes, and guys, this is what I was telling you about in some of the images I pulled up. Um, that's down at CTIO in Chile. Those are 16 inch uh, Ritchie Sheraton telescopes. With uh, It's kind of a unique um, installation. Each one of those objective mirrors has a coating on it that makes it sensitive, like, like putting a filter on it, but it's coated onto the it's coated onto the mirror. Onto the mirror? Yes. And it has filters. Now you ask a question, what frequencies are they sensitive to? And if you or I had the time, we'd just keep drilling on that. We'd go to the prompt site and they'd give an engineering description of it and, and uh, specifications, all that sort of stuff, if you wanted to go research that. I haven't recently. I just know basically that's how they work. Okay. So let's back out here and... I could show you the same thing about university programs, but um, you get the idea. Harvard Smithsonian's on there with their, um, when I go to those sites, I try to find the high energy discussions. It saves, everybody, it saves you a step. If you wanted to go look at that, uh, that information, what I've tried to do with the links in here is take you right to the, the part in their website that talks about high energy or gamma ray bursts. Sorry, it's so slow this morning. See what, did you see that? That's me and my dad, by the way. Last, last uh, October, Zermatt. Do you see what they see what they did with the, I mean, it's just, that's not the image I put up there. It's just all this, Yahoo does all this stuff, and it's like, you got to suffer through it. Um, <laughs> You see, yeah, you see, I'm, sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. Right, sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. But this is the, um, this is the guts of, of what this does. And, um, you know, what I suggest to folks if they're relatively new to looking at the phenomena is use that tutorial folder and, and go in there. Some people have a, you know, a thing about using the Wikipedia. You know, it's gotten very good over the years with this sort of stuff. And you can tell because there aren't too many uh, notices out there that people are challenging the content on a particular web page. Uh, so I use that somewhat, but um, and somewhat I come back to if I have to look something up in a hurry. But the um, the way we get this data to look at, the SWIFT satellite picks up the burst and immediately radios to the ground stations where the location is. It slews, it's, it runs the, uh, the X-ray camera runs in two modes. It runs in photon counting mode and it runs in window timing mode. And window timing means it's taking a picture, it's doing some imaging. And it sends down some, some very low resolution um, images just because you don't want to burn up too much time on the, on the scope when it has other data to transmit. But it will eventually go and transmit everything down here and you'll have a couple sites where you see that third folder down as data reduction. And uh, that'll show, uh, predominantly with this uh, satellite, it's University of, is it University of Leicester in uh, in England, not too far from London. Anybody know that school? They've got a great um, graduate program for this. And they do a lot of data reduction with the X-ray imaging uh, in particular to pinpoint the source and to determine how bright it is. And you know, they can slice it into bandwidth based on the, uh, the energy of the gamma ray particles and hard X-ray particles that are hitting the detectors. But more or less, the, the important thing with this also is this comes through real time. 
or, or very, very close to real time. It hits the server. The scientific community lots of times has an FTP port into that uh, network that the server sits on. This comes through for this particular site as a, uh, an email push from, uh, from Goddard. I can't respond to it, or somebody who's a member on, on this Yahoo group can't respond to it. They filter it, and so it's not for discussion. It's just more or less for, for us to look at and see what's happening. I have a little bandwidth trouble up here. There we go. All right, this is an example of uh, the primary source I use for the refined uh, ground positions. And you see over here, just the labeling's pretty typical so that you get it in uh, time sequence um, in reverse order. 13097A means that was the first burst detected on the 7th of September. Um, you get down here in August. Um, August 7th, 2013, it'll show you the location. It'll show you within 90% uh, confidence level uh, what the um, air circle is, the bore site. And you can see if you started with two or three arc minutes when it was first detected, now it's skinny it all the way down to, to one and a half seconds. So it's pretty good, uh, pretty good pointing accuracy. Yeah, it used to be, uh, in the early days, maybe 30 degrees. Yeah. yeah. This is not, I'll show you some data you get off the X-ray telescope um, on board the satellite. This is a lot more, the pixels uh, resolution is a lot higher. And my guess is they send down some very basic data uh, to find out the pointing. And then at some point, the satellite downloads everything they got off of that camera. And uh, this group over in England picks it up. And it essentially goes and statistically looks for um, brightness in certain areas, uh, computes an average, and reports, comes back and reports the bore site. You don't really see an x-ray source in there, so let's go try to find, let's go try to find one that, that you do. I'm trying to remember, recently there have been some really bright ones. That's not a good example. Is there, there's other x-ray sources in that field? You see them? Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Here and here. Not much, not so much there. I'll you scroll this. Stars or, or A star could have an X-ray um, component to it. Absolutely. Let's see if I find a good find a good one for you here. back to here once I take a look at a good Let's see, it takes, I've got some other links in here it takes you right to it I'll come back to it because I don't want to spend too much time on it I've got some examples I can show you All right, but that's um, that's an example of data reduction. Somebody's doing it. It's it, in the last six years. It's become a lot. You know, you find yourself sometimes being pulled back to the same site, just because these have gotten a lot more capable in terms of the data they can report. Everybody okay? Yeah, I'm okay. Uh, no worries. This is raw data coming off the, um, the scope, so uh, real-time information. It'll show you um, these are the files typically that come off every time a burst is reported. Um, they're identified with the trigger number that's more or less in chronological uh, sequence, low to high. And then the bursts many times are given those um, tags, as I showed you, you know, for September 7th, it's 13.09.07 is, is how that looks. It tells you what time it was received. Um, let's see if I got a light curve here from the, from the burst alert telescope. Um, you'll see these. Um, it's, it wasn't a super 
Um, bright burst, if it's a super bright burst, you see a lot more data points on that grid, but you can see the background radiation is probably around here, and this lasted about 100 seconds. So, and that's typical. I mean, they don't last a very long time, so it's important for, for SWIFT to go pick them up and then move to it and see if it can see, uh, see if it can pick up an X-ray source. That's a better example, more refined curve. Um, when you read through these circulars on a on a day-to-day -day basis, if you remember your high school and college um, physics or the math you might have had, uh, this is a decaying pulse of decay function, right? So you'll see a lot of times the description uh, that some of the observatories will put out is this um, this curve is best defined by a power law, and they give the parameters of the power law, that sort of thing, because they run it through a tool that mathematically calculates it. And uh, the other thing you might remember from your statistics, uh, sometimes it's described in terms of a chi-squared distribution. A, no a normal curve would be like this. This is something that starts from zero and decays quickly. So statistically, the, the, um, the observations and the reports about the, the burst are shown that way. So the horizontal was time? Yes. yes. All right. This is on board the X-ray. Here's an example of a um, low-resolution X-ray image of that particular burst. Okay, so remember the ones we looked at with the gray and I couldn't find one in the center. I'll go back and take a look at this one. But very well resolution, you know, uh, white is hot, blue is cool, you know, in terms of where that's coming from. So that telescope operates in photon counting mode for a period of time and then it also does the imaging. This would tell the ground there's a good uh, x-ray candidate there, go study that. And then uh, here's with the visual camera, and you can see they're actually, it, it's very likely that source is a, that source also had a visual component, okay? So this is just stuff that comes off the telescope on the satellites, or the group of instruments on the telescope, on the satellite. <clears throat> what the ground um, observatories will do is they'll say, hey, that's got an optical counterpart, hey, that's got an x-ray counterpart, let's go look at that. Uh, the ground obser observatories are very interested in seeing if it's got an infrared component to it, because they'll go and measure it with a um, spectrometer and determine if there's redshift with it. And the redshift calculates how far away it is, how fast it's moving. And to give you an idea why this is such a you know, um, big area to study right now, the furthest burst detected based on using the redshift method was about 13 billion, 13.2 billion light years distance. And what do we estimate the age of the Big Bang? Anyone know? 13.7, 13.8. See, so you can imagine how far back in time these go. In current epoch, it, they're very rare. I mean, you can imagine if, if one went off in our galaxy and was generally pointed in our direction, you know, we wouldn't have an atmosphere and it would pretty much annihilate everything quickly. Um, you know about the Fermi principle that somebody brought up at one of the discussions yesterday? All right, so there's a thought that life couldn't have originated back in this period of history of the universe because these were going off right and left, and how could life form when there was this, this much energy being scattered around, you know, within particular galaxies? What have you? All right, so I'm going to backtrack here. I mean, there's some identifiers. I don't know if you can read it or not, but OBSID means um, observation ID number. This is that tag number that goes with it, and I can't read it here. Five six nine nine two, and the date was. September 7th. So what I'll do if I want to study that a little more is I'll go back. I'll go back here to um, somebody sign on and apply for membership while we're here. Yeah. Did you? Yeah. I can tell because they're kind of rare. See this up here? Yeah. I can choose to accept or deny. <laughs> <laughs> The same thing, the same, last time I did this at George Mason, the same thing happened because there was Wi-Fi in, in the, uh, you know, in the enterprise, or the uh, large room in there, and I was demoing this, and Phil was helping me out, and I, I said, who signed up? And there's only 38 members. Right, yeah, which is another thing I want to ask you guys at some point. I'm trying to get a little more publicity for this and, and get, the, uh, get the outreach component working. Um, but let's go back to that. Did I say that? Hmm? You can <laughs> I will. I'll show you how I do that in a minute. It, can't, it probably came through my email. I'll show you. I'll show you in a minute. Um, we we will definitely we will definitely do that. All right. So what did I say that was September seventh? Yeah. Yeah. 
Come on now. And I know the, the ID had some zeros and fives in it. They do? Yeah. <laughs> they start out zero, zero. All right, where I wanted to go. Uh, All right, so I'm going to go down here to 97 now. It's most recently reported. It was just a couple days ago. There's a good example of the x-ray source. Okay, so um, the, the image I showed you with the blues and the reds and the whites and the yellows is what the, the instrument on board the satellite sent down. It does a data dump, and you get a much better resolution on it. And they've, run, they've gotten that particular bore site by... In this case, it was so bright, it picked up all those, all that green is a bunch of green circles around that source, so it must have been a very concentrated source. And then they'll go back out and report, you know, the location, and they'll show you the uh, air radius. It's 1.4 seconds of arc, you know, so it's pretty tight. And then the ground sources go and look at it. So I'll just show you now basically what's coming down. This was the 0055 with the zeros missing, but that's the tag. All right, all this, and again, I, I got to, when I ask people to take a look at this sort of thing, it really does take a lot of patience because you're, you're, this, this stuff drips, drips off the satellite all the time, and I've learned quite a bit with it. But um, these parameters that get sent down from the satellite when it's first detected, and these are in chronological order, starting with the first detection on it. And you'll, you'll read over here. Uh, say it was a, yeah, it's not, all right, so some other, it's some other source, okay. So it'll give the, uh, it'll give the parameters. It'll show you where the sun and moon are, give you some comments about it. It's, it looks like the one that is actually a GRB. Yeah, it says it so you guys are keying right in on it. So remember I said this was within three arc minutes off the detectors on the satellite, your coordinates, okay? And uh, these comments, you just got to read this as the satellite pushes it through. This is a rate trigger, which generates that 5-5 number. And there are, it, it's easier to go and say this is 130907 because you, you remember the date you were working on. Um, what happens immediately is there's, there is a bit of an onboard database. It's not huge on the satellite. So it'll go compare that location to see if there's anything in that um, particular error circle that ever been recorded before. And then it'll downlink it um, to the ground. And there's a much larger database on the ground. We'll go take a look and say, well, no, we didn't have a detection there either. So um, based on that, those couple pieces of information, they determine this is a, a GRB. Next thing that happens on the satellite is... Uh, let's see. Okay, um, it has some discussion about whether or not the spacecraft's going to go and sl slew over to it and look at it with the X-ray telescope. Uh, all right, so here, th this is the third. Da I mean, this is all happening very quickly. This is the third downlink from the satellite, and says the Swift spacecraft made a slew decision. It will immediately slew to this target. It does not match a source in the uh, ground catalog. Same message you got before. And so now it's, it's moving. And you get more information. It just, you, can re you can really get down the weeds with this. But once you've been looking at it for a while, you get an idea what the detection messages are with it. I'm trying to bounce back and forth between things that are really you know down in the weeds and a few other things that are interesting to look at. There, there was a nice. Um, there was a nice Yahoo benefit um, that I hadn't counted on that might actually be uh, be helpful to folks to just kind of determine it, you know, to intrinsically get it. 
Isn't that a hassle to open that up? Um, before Yahoo changed their, their groups, the last couple of years, what the, um, uh, the team that goes and sends these messages out from the satellite has become accustomed to doing is sending a little thumbnail of the images that comes out. Um, and then if you ever use Flickr or some of those other um, imaging sites, These are all more or less in sequential order too. So if you said, I want to see, so one of these seem, seems interesting to me, I want to take a look at it. I mean, these are, you're going to find these because I was doing cut and paste to put that banner on top of the site over Labor Day weekend. That's why those are there. Um, but I mean, here's a star field. May or may not be anything in there, but that's what the, and there's a small error circle in it. You can open that and say, is there anything to see there? You know, again, this is the visual telescope, so there may not be a visual source there. It doesn't detect infrared. Um, you get star fields, what have you. These are what these, um, the first light curve that comes down is the radiation from the particle detector in terms of how many counts per second. You see these are all, you know, they've got their own fingerprints. It's still a pulse and decay function. Some of these are just blank star fields. This, is, this isn't a group of bursts. This is probably a bright star field where they occur. Let's see if I can find one that's a real monster. There are a few monsters in here. <laughs> Any questions while I'm going along here? Anything looks suspicious in that group of photos? This and this and this and this. That was a monster. So um, what I want to do is find out more information about that particular monster. And you'll see up here on the top, uh, start and stop, okay, universal time, trigger number, that 55 number that gets exposed to it. Um, I can go look up 559642. Would somebody try to remember that for me? It's 150 seconds. And this was with the uh, UVOC camera, which stands for uh, Ultraviolet and Visual Optical Telescope. Um, it got in close enough to just get that huge burst. It's black in the middle because it's, it's pinged off. It's completely saturated the, those pixels. So let's go look for 559642. 559642. Yeah, I could do that, you know, but they're in sequential order. Five, five. A couple other databases guy you can, that, that uh, x-ray database that comes from England, you can do a search that way too. Okay, here we go. Um, they're all, be, this is the satellite chatter, okay. This is the light curve. Okay. What, what does the time resolution change between those? Sometimes it has fine time resolution. Sometimes it's closer time resolution. Yeah, it's going, it has a lot to do with how long the burst is going to be. And my guess is they sense, so they'll take it for a certain basic period of time. But sometimes they get more than one light curve. So if they think there's going to be characteristics that they want to report, they'll let it go until they remember it's pulse and decay. At some point, you're down below the threshold. You know, so when you get down below, and it'll compute the threshold. So once it's down below that threshold, there's more or less background noise again, then it stops. But it could last a few seconds. It could last 100 seconds or so. Just that part of it. These optical um, components that show up on some of the other images and with the chatter, they can last from a couple hours to a couple of days. Okay, so if there's an X-ray and optical counterpart associated with it, um, you get a lot of attention from um, from ground observatories. If it's relatively bright and they determine there's an infrared spectrum in particular, you'll get the big, you know, Mauna Kea scopes looking at this and doing measurements. And especially if they're going to run spectra analysis, they'll come back and say, you know, 
we detect this, they calculate the red shift and they can determine how far away it is based on that. It's very accurate. So, I mean, you can imagine if you're a grad student and you, you, you're lucky enough to get a run on, you know, gem north or gem south, and then one of these occurs and they have to go look, well, then you have to go reschedule your, your, um, And does it use Tetris so it can get the results down immediately? Does it use? Tetris or something else to get the? I don't know the actual application it's using for. But it comes down in real time? Yes. It goes, comes down real time and, and the, uh, the guy who runs this over at, at the um, at Goddard. Here's another picture of the X-ray component. His name is um, Scott Bartleby, and the uh, uh, principal investigator for this is Neil Garrels, and he's still doing it apparently. But look at that. I mean, it's enormous. Now, ask me how much energy that represents. What have you? I've really got to drill down. I'm kind of learning that as I go along. But there are two, uh, two observations within a short period of time of each other that show that. So um, what do we say this guy was? 559642. Five, now what I want to take you to is um, Circular's arch archive. These comments that come from the um, local community show up on the um, they show up in these comments as what are called GCN, Gamma Ray Burst Coordinates Network. Uh, whole lot of data here, so it's one of those things you got to be, you really do have to be patient with. Here's bursts of special interest, <clears throat> give me an idea. What do we say that was? Uh, What was the date? July 2nd. Was it? Yeah. Kevin, was it or was it? Yeah, it was July 2nd this year. Okay. So you see that in some of these cases, they'll, they'll, this particular part of the site is called Bursts of Recent Interest. So rather than going through all this thing, thing piece by piece, you might want to go to this part of the website and look. And this is more, and again, this is the this is the, the nuts and bolts of it, but you've really got to be patient with it. Um, it'll tell you for example, what the image, you go take a look at, at who's leading this. This is the Palomar 60-inch telescope that's taking a peek at it. Um, they give an error circle, um, that type of information, some follow-up activity. You know, and this is all, as compared with the spacecraft data coming down, anything that comes off of GCN circulars is a observation from a ground um, site. Okay, so you get a lot of that. I'm just going to, I try to encourage people to take their time with this. I can't do it in the course of a one-hour presentation, but this is essentially what you, you, uh, you want to be taking a look at to learn the most you can about what's going on. I'm just going to take you through one more sample of these that I found that was pretty good. Um, April 27th was a really bright burst. And um, what I want to show you with this is you're getting comments from all over the electromagnetic spectrum from ground observatories. So this is a good example of that. It was a very bright burst. In blue, I don't know if I can make this any bigger. In blue is um, a comment about all three instruments aboard SWIFT, what they looked at. Um, it tells you it's got that arc, three arc minute radius, which is pretty broad. It's statistical and it shows you, no, it's 90% containment is what, two sigma? Anybody remember for a normal distribution? Uh, yes, like 90. Yeah, and three sigma is 99. And, yeah. yeah. So um, it, it, it reports it statistically and shows it where it is. The next thing, this was the BAT, the Burst Source Telescope. It's a pair of flat panels. This is the X-ray telescope. Uh, began to observe it. Uh, I can't see whether or not it said it was from photon counting mode or <coughs> imaging. If it's going to go and show the um, the bore site, it's it's doing an imaging mode. Here it's a four point. It's gone from three arc minutes down to four point seven arc seconds with ninety percent containment. Containment. It's had a very bright optical component. 
and I can go back and show you that later, but uh, they take an imaging here using white filter and um, you get some basic information about that. Then you start getting all this ground chatter coming through. Um, this particular case, this is Caltech using the uh, P60 telescope. I talked about somebody that lunch. The P60 telescope at Mount Palomar is called the uh, Oscar Meyer scope because that family donated the money to, to build it. But, you know, um, through the professional community, they listed the P60. So that took a look. And um, they compare it to sky surveys all the time. There's also a spot on the site they'll take them to most of the sky surveys if you have curiosity. For, for us, I doubt we want to download one of the sky surveys. It's huge amounts of data and, uh, and, and occupies big file servers. But they take a look and they make these comparisons against other um, objects in the sky. And they can take a look at the light curve and say, well, this, this is calibrated to this particular star and this particular uh, filter. All right, so that information comes down. The reason they're looking for this is now they're starting to get an idea of, they know this is a low redshift event, meaning it's relatively close. High redshift means further away, moving, moving away from us faster. This is the Fox telescope. It's robotically controlled now. And um, ask me where that is, and I've forgotten, quite honestly. I think it's, I think it's in the Canary Islands. Um, and now they've detected a source at 21 magnitude. Really, really bright. And over time, you'll see this. Now this is 22. Oh, if a big scope got it, this is 22 magnitude. Or maybe it started at 19 or 18, and now it's, you see it fading. Here's a good example. Um, this was reported by UCAL Berkeley, OK, with Paratel Telescope in Arizona. And this is the, you don't get images from the ground, which is a little disappointing. But the reason for that is it's too important to catch the data as opposed to take a pretty picture, you know, um, which is why they're doing that. But here you see 12, 11, 12 magnitude. I mean, with our scopes up here, we could see that, right? For most of us. And you see the, uh, there's another part on the site here. It'll take you through the uh, photometry uh, band for these different types of filters. You take a look at that. Here's a good example looking at that particular source. Remember we talked about when the star blows up, it blows up star cookies all over the nearby community. So here they're looking with spectra and determine that there's, a, uh, there's calcium, there's hydrogen, there's potassium. It goes all the way up to iron because fusion stops at iron. So magnesium one, magnesium two. Okay, you know how you look through your O3 filters and things of that nature? I gotta bring this up just to show you real quickly. A lot of times when they're determining the spectra, they're going and looking at the Lyman Alpha series. You remember your valence levels and, you know, if it accepts, if it accepts an electron, you're getting absorption, or if it accepts a photon, you're getting absorption feature at those wavelengths. If gas is cooling down, it's, you know, you get an emission line. Okay, and again, those wavelengths. So if they see a, a group of those, you know, signatures and it's redshifted to a certain area, they calculate it very precisely and that's how they know what the redshift value is for it. Okay, hydrogen is pretty common. You know, you see that a lot of the time. Okay, um, so in the interest of time, because I want to show you something here from what's coming out of University of North Carolina. Does anybody have any, um, any questions so far? You're a quiet bunch. No. Nothing? Sleep deprived. Sleep deprived, yeah, and this stuff, you guys are all being very patient because this is very, um, very specific data. So so there's ways to find this as it's coming in, but you know, in this particular case, we went to that burst of special interest, and it, this is all you know, appended on um, in sequence. Here you have somebody looking at those. Remember we were looking at 11th and 12th? You know, some time's lapsed now, and they're getting it in 14th, so it's fading. And um, J, H. J, those are infrared bands. Yeah. Tom, what are we, in general, what are we learning from studying these and studying the individual ones and, and every one that, that we're detecting? What, how does this database and this information help us to understand? What's going on in the universe? 
I'll tell you what I think and based on what I read here, because you're, you're getting very basic scientific observations. You're kind of left to surmise what is this, what are we looking at kind of thing. And, and um, without having read it, the, you know, the, you know, I pay attention to this as probably a, a star collapsing, a wolf riot type star collapsing and, and emitting this, these gamma particles in a beam out the north and south pole of the, of the star. Um, I, as far back in history as they are, in, in, in cosmological history, my thinking is, well, you know, early on the universe, these stars formed, they weren't as stable as our sun, a lot of them. And uh, this, the nuclear fusion, as that hap happens, hydrogen goes to helium, and helium's, what's the next step in that um, phase for a star? I can't remember if Howard, or if Howard was here to tell me. But if you, find, if you follow a main sequence for stars, the different elements that get produced while fusion's happening, at some point the core can't support you know, the outer layers anymore, they spin off in the general vicinity. And uh, this burst occurs, you're left with a very, you're left, the thinking is you're left with a black hole, but everything around it absorbed this energy. So we get to see it by virtue of, if it's a visual burst or infrared burst, we go look at that afterglow and determine what those particular elements are. So here you've got a factory for, you know, hydrogen at different levels, oxygen, potassium you saw up there, magnesium, you've got these heavier elements that are showing up that heretofore had been in that particular star starting with hydrogen and helium. So now you've got a, a cloud of debris in a particular part of a galaxy maybe. I mean sometimes these are thought to be extra galactic, they're outside of a, a galactic shell. Um, but you've got a whole lot of heavier elements that, you know, as, as things coalesce over time are probably the formation of of dust particles and clouds of dust and gas that that, that uh, you know solar systems form out of. Okay, so now are these population one stars? Population one stars way back that we're looking at. Well, I, th I think the area of interest is I don't know if I, that's going to answer your question, but but people look if it's a really if, if it gets everybody's attention, it's because it's a lot brighter than normal, or it's a lot more distant than the normal population. And more or less current epic, we don't see it. Okay, it doesn't happen now. Okay, maybe it would happen in the star next door, but it'd be very rare. Um, I mean, you see supernova in this kind of epic of the universe history. But going back in that band of what's happening earlier in the universe, you see this quite a bit. So you know, I kind of liken it to you know Chinese firecrackers going off the you know Chinese New Year. These things were at one point in the history of the universe they were popping all the time. If we see a burst, and we see a burst about once a day on average. But some days it's, you don't see it for a week, and another day you'll see five or six at once. Um, and it gets everybody's attention, they got visual counterparts. We only see them if those beams are pointed more or less in our direction, like, a, like it would be a lighthouse, you know, like a point at your guys' heads. But, you know, it, it's got to be pointed in that direction. We'd see it here and here, uh, here and here and here and everywhere else that they point. Um, they estimate it's probably 500 times what we'd see. If we, there's probably 500 in a day, one of our days going off, you know, in, in universal frame of reference from a time perspective, it means they're going off all the time at, at some period in the universe. There's just quite, you know, uh, quite a bit of it happening. So um, from that standpoint, that's, that's the interesting piece. You remember when we first started measuring distances in the galaxy, in our galaxy, we used parallax, mm -hmm. and that cosmic ladder goes from parallax up to, um, to variable stars, yeah. And then after variable stars, it went into redshift after Hubble proposed it, and they figured a way to, to measure with that. So you're getting a lot of redshift data because it's so far away. Um, but that's the attraction to it. It's, it's the cosmology of it. It's the elemental structure of what's involved in those, um, in, in the relative vicinity of those stars when they explode. Um, and the frequency of it in terms of how many have happened. You can, these, these are just factories of heavier elements. So I don't know if there's a direct link to that. You know, Harold would be good, a good guy to ask um, whether or not that's you know, the, the primary uh, source of the heavy elements we had in galaxies in the universe to go and form, um, you know, form clouds and that stuff for, for heavier elements to kind of coalesce. Okay. Um, in the last five minutes, if we run over, it's going to be up to you guys. I, I um, put in here uh, a group of telescopes in Chile and coming online in Australia. Uh, I just got here. And you can get that through this, uh, get to that easily through this thing? So I put SkyNet in there. The observatories folder? Mm -hmm. 
four meter class and smaller. These are 16 inch telescopes I put in there with a lot of other ones. Um, this program was started by a group of astronomers and led by a guy named Dan Reichert, and we landed Dan to come speak at our November monthly event. So he put together these telescopes as a group, got the funding for it at the CTIO Observatory, which is way up in the Chilean Indies, and um, there's half a dozen of them. And they have, it's, it's very unique, they've taken the, the coatings on the objective mirrors and they're a little different. They're, it's almost like they built a filter onto the mirror. And the reason they did that is the, the, the purpose of them is to be very, very speedy. So a burst occurs, they slur to it or slew to it immediately, and without having to go worry about the filter wheel, they've already got imaging going on and, and as quickly as they can get the data. So that was the whole purpose of the program. 16-inch scope will take you to what 19th magnitude maybe or about right, you know. But and uh, plus you've got a lot less air mass at that altitude, so that's their uh, their purpose. And then um, as part of their outreach, uh, he's at UNC Chapel Hill. Part of, part of their outreach was to go to some of the other Division Two and Division Three schools and get their astronomy departments involved with it. They created uh, the robotically controlled from UNC Chapel Hill, and. Uh, they build a network, and you remember this from, from the Terminator, the Skynet, the machines. To, you know, that, that gig's all over, and people are always cracking up about that. Yes. But um, they've got, uh, these are set up as, as a burst occurs. When I showed you the, the information coming down from the satellite, the first blip it gets, whether or not the satellite's confirmed on the catalogs or not, whether it is really a burst, they go slew anyway. If it's in their field of view, you know, that part of the, that part of the world in their field of view in the sky is clear and it's dark. They'll go pick it up immediately. So he's building that out. They created this network now that we have the internet that uh, you can get it from, you know, you can get it from uh, from anywhere. These, uh, let me see if I can show you a picture of the, how that looks. There's a Skynet too, so I didn't want to do the Skynet. No, I could. You guys, Arnold. Yeah. I just want to show you these scopes look like. Yeah, then I'm going to show you. I, I had my first run. Um, Dan gave me time on these scopes, so you can go and submit. If, if you're authorized for an education program, you can go and submit for time on these because they're dormant. That well, they're working, but you know they have top priority goes to a burst. So if it gets a burst, whatever's running gets scrubbed, and they all go look. Okay, <clears throat> but they're not super heavily used, and they're only used at the moment for their outreach initiative. So he and I have been talking last month or two about coming up here to speak to us, and he said you want to try these out, and he gave me an account on it, and I'll I'll show you what I pulled down. Um, I just did that last week before um, before heading over here. But that's what, this is where they uh, are installed in Chile. Okay, and I pulled this up. Wiki's the easiest way to take a look at this. These are 16 inch. Um, does anybody know this Richie Sheraton design? Anybody use that type of a scope? Anybody up here have a scope that, that do we usually see those kind of designs or? There were a couple on the field. Were there? Yeah. Um, but that's how they're designed. They're all robotically controlled out of the server at Chapel Hill. But just to give you an idea, he gave me access to that database um, morning before, today is what, Monday, Saturday morning, I submitted a job to it. I thought about it a while in terms of what part of the sky to look at, and I asked him to, uh, to give me an idea. He said, well, why don't you shoot M28? Because I asked him to look at variable star fields, and I said, uh, give me a good variable star field that's kind of, you know, typical for what this, you know, imaging equipment would be able to look at. And, uh, he gave me that, and then I set it up to run six, six 100-second observations um, at space 30 minutes apart, more or less. Now, if somebody else was imaging or had more priority, you'd get bumped. But I was happy to, I was happy to see here. I picked this up yesterday morning. I just can't meet you. Here we are in Middle West Virginia, and I'm communicating with a server in Chapel Hill, and they're running a group of scopes in Chile, and I'm bringing that up back up here while I'm drinking my coffee yesterday. You know, and I ran another one last night. But just to give you an idea, unless this is noise, you see the changes in the stars in the background? Unless it's noise, and I ran another group last night just kind of for confirmation, but you see those changes. 
And that's probably going, the 16 inch telescope will go down to, what do we say, 18th, 19th magnitude maybe? Or is that too, is that too faint? No, it's 100 seconds earlier, especially on top of the mountain in Chile. Yeah. Down to 18 or 19? Yeah. 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 Yeah, it's like, oops, there they are. Oops, no, they're not. Yeah, but, oh, okay. Yeah, I'm yeah. yeah, which way is it going? Fewer or more? They come and go. It's like, oops, there they are. Oops, they're not. You know, it's, it, these are, and these were recorded, if I had set up for 100 second exposures uh, 30 minutes apart, right? So that's over the space of, what, two and a half hours? So the period of some of these variables is... Unless that's noise, you know. In the back, can you see them very well? I don't know if I can make them any bigger. You pick it out. Uh, yeah, that was my thought too. You can see a little bit. I mean, look at look look at look, look look right here. Yeah, Look right in that region right there. See it? So you know, I'll go. Yeah. So I mean, this is just kind of an offshoot of what I've been doing. You know, you, you just end up learning a lot and. Um, as you kind of go along, I don't have a, with my scope, I don't have an imaging setup. I, you know, it's a, my television's a point and shoot, doesn't have a equatorial mount on it. Um, this is data from, I ran it again last night, so this is the data. I haven't had a chance to look at it yet, but I, I have a file, so, you know, that resolution is a little different. You know, the resolution wasn't as good there, so I have to take a look at it. There's, um, well, I don't have it running in the, there's a program associated with this called Afterglow, because, um, I mean, that's what everybody's looking for. They're looking for the, from Earth anyway, they're looking for the Afterglow of these events. But you can do other things with it. So the more I, you know, the more I do this, and then I go back and read the stuff that's coming through on the circulars, um, from the astronomy community, um, it's kind of given me observations to the, the entire, you know, electromagnetic spectrum. You know, you get some radio in there, and you get now and then. There's one observation I have in here somewhere, but I'm not going to bring it up. Do you, do you know what Ice Cube is in the South Pole? Yes. Mm -hmm. Neutrino detector. So from time to time, if it's really bright, they'll go look for that. They'll go look for neutrinos. And the only one I found on here that referenced that, they didn't see anything. They said we we observed, we didn't pick anything up, kind of thing. But so I mean, you're going all over the place with the with the spectrum. So that's what I, that's all I've got. Unless we want to see different parts of the some of those other links. I try to make it. I mean, it, it's one of those things where, like I said, it was for my own curiosity at first, and then I decided to make it so people could kind of learn about them a little bit. You know, start with that first. Um, start with that first group of links. And for, for me, because I can get in pretty deep, I have three or four tabs open to the home page. But start with that. As you learn what's going on with that, then go into this a little bit and start digging around. When you're in that group of links, you can you remember all the things that I was linking through images and that sort of thing. You can get in pretty deep and forget where you are, and you don't want to back out. So you can just go to another start page. And if you pull up conversations, that'll Tom, do you have to join the group to see that page? You do. Yeah. You do. So I've got to put Guy on here. Let's we'll see if guys, I can find Guy. One of the things I've noticed, if I can make a comment, is yeah. how weird and strange all of the light curves are. It's yeah. not like they're, you know, they really fall as neatly into two categories, right. as they say. I they have the same thought. They all seem to be unique. Yeah. yeah. I have the same. It's really strange. Yes, it is. Because most, you know, I mean, you think life is, you know, sort of super complex, but all these things are just so bizarre. You know, I would be 
Um, this was 15, 20 years ago now, so it's, everything I read was completely out of date. But you know, they were theorizing about the causes for some of this stuff. And I was sort of thinking, really? But how do you know that? Thank you for asking that question. I'm gonna take I'm gonna take you right there. So look at Yeah, so um, it's going to make it any bigger. Well, are there any two there that the photos? No, it's like they're off, they don't have fingerprints. You know, it's, so you can tell, really you, yeah, I mean, this is, that's wildly different yeah. than that, okay? Sometimes that, that double, that double burst thing is more indicative of a longer light curve. You know, why did that happen? Did we see the bulk of the radiation and then there was another spike? This is a, I mean, that's, um, unless that spiked the equipment and didn't show it, this is, you know, I, I gotta think that's no. an aberration, you know. Um, here shows up as a normal distribution, kind of goes up. This, here's a typical pulse and decay function. And they'll describe that in terms of, you know, what a decay function looks like. You remember that had a, what was the area based natural log and then it shows a, uh, your exponent for your natural log shows how steep the curve is and there's two parts of it. There's the immediate decay and then there's at some point that you cut to another curve that shows the slower decay on that. But it kind of makes you think, I don't know the science behind it, but it makes you think that it has to happen in a very narrow space because uh, it means that the different components of the emission are interacting with each other, which means they have to have enough time to do so. And remember, this is Earth time, you know. This happens a few seconds of our time. Can, can yeah. cosmologic standpoint, you know, I just, it's, it's pretty mind boggling in terms of how quickly it happens. But yes. You'll see if, you'll see, uh, I can't read that light curve. <laughs> okay. But they're in different, they're in different bands. Or either, well, to tell you the truth, they're different. Um, that's actually radio. If you look at the uh, y axis, it's ergs per second per. Per, per cycle, per frequency. So you get different types of. Oh, where'd they go? And you get down in here, and if it's, you can, if something looks really interesting to you, you can go ahead and study it if it was brought down by Swift. <sighs> It's helpful if they show on it who's who sourced it. I don't know who that is. Any other questions? If you you know, give me something you want to look at here, I can probably go find it. I'd like to make to make a comment about the observatories. You start to learn their characteristics. For example, the master net um, in Russia almost never sees them. So when they see them, you have to cheer for them. When they see yeah. Them. There's all sky cameras. There's um, you certainly learn you learn to what you can expect from certain observatories. Master net recently saw one. Sorry. Yeah, this is the um, this is the Oscar Mayer telescope. That's my wife and a guy named Scott Cardell. Um, Bob Parks hired Scott away from Scott was the outreach guy at Palomar, and um, this is a few years ago. We went to San Diego for um, a vacation, and we went up to see Palomar since it was so close. So that's a 16 inch mirror and then you've got this imaging equipment hanging on the back of it and it's fiber optic connected now. I, I don't know how they get the signal on and off Palomar. Maybe they ran fiber up there. I mean, before there was fiber, it was a microwave link all over Southern California from different observatories to use. But I mean, it's lightning fast. This is robotically controlled. If it's something that Palomar wants to look at because it's clear and it's in the right part of the sky, they'll scrub what's ever on that. Um, you know, whatever telescope time or whatever job's being run, they'll scrub it to go look. And, um, you know, it's just a whole lot to it. So, I mean, that's a, we're looking at 16 inch scopes for making contributions. It's kind of tough for us as amateur astronomers to, because you have to wait for it to happen. You have to be lucky. You have to be out there when it happens in the right part of the sky and it's clear and it's dark and it's bright enough um, to go look at. But amateurs do collect that information. There's a group on, uh, how many of you uh, use ABSA site? Anybody? Anybody do variable star observing? No? Let me just tell you where it is if you do get an ABSA because it's very popular. Um, 
ABSO's um, division that studies uh, gamma ray bursts, because it is a variable source, is called the HEN, the High Energy Network. Anybody, seen, anybody been in there before? Okay. So this is a very basic homepage for it, but you can really drill down on it, and they'll accept observations. So, but you got to be a little lucky. The um, on Skynet, you know, where I took those M28 pictures, I'll just show you this, and then we can wrap up. This um, this is this is a galactic map. So Milky Way in the middle here. Okay, um, all these little bullseyes are telescopes are on Skynet. So you see a few of these are, you know, DSO is either at Appalachian State University or somewhere near uh, University of North Carolina. Um, Erkes was on there, they might have taken it off. These are the, um, it's dark in, uh, southeastern Australia, but they're still bringing these online. So I haven't, in the time I've been using this, I haven't seen it yet. Um, and these are the prompt telescopes in Chile. If I go pick one, you should see, um, man, it's hard to see there. You see the, you see the color change there? Yeah, yeah, it tells you which scope's looking at what. So that's, well, it's inside the dome and it's locked, so it just says it's at rest. But can you see that little red, that little red thing? Could you see it move? That's the part of the sky is pointing at, but it's inside the dome, the dome shut. And, um, at night, when you see this, they just kind of creep around. You know, this was incredible beginner's luck. The first night I had, I think I told somebody this, the first, you know, Dan told me how this works and gave me an account on it. And it was sitting in my kitchen table, and I was having dinner, and it was just kind of nearby. I was kind of watching these things creep around at night. And then there was like maybe this one, this one, this one, and this one. And all four of them started to, to move, and they all converged on a spot right about here. And I knew based on what these scopes were designed for to begin with that it was a, a burst um, sighting. So I went over to the, um, you know, the Yahoo group I just showed you, looked at the message, and sure enough, within, within the last 60 seconds, it had come down off the satellite. These telescopes got it, and they slewed right to the point to start imaging. I, I can tell you that'll probably never happen again. <laughs> you know, just the, the likelihood of that happening. And um, I mean, I looked at it right away. I knew what was going on. So, so why are they putting multiple scopes on, on one source? Because the, um, remember the um, objectives were treated a little bit differently so oh, that they were sensitive. Different. OK, that's why there's multiple scopes there, because mm -hmm. they, they're all what? They're all sensitive to frequencies that you typically see uh, after glow in, in, in infrared spectrum in particular. But they're all different. Mm -hmm. each, each a little different. different. And, it has, and it has a filter wheel. Okay? But the, in the interest of the expediency of the whole thing, they slew, they move right to the point, and they can start imaging right away mm -hmm. without fooling around with filter wheels and everything else because they want to get exactly what's coming off of that afterglow source as soon as possibly they can after it. There's a, a telescope at, at Los, um, Los Alamos called Raptor. Mm -hmm. And Raptor's, you know Raptor? Yes. There's wide sky, wide field. Yeah. So they can be, they'll pick up if they're just, just because they have visibility in the sky. The, the brightest one we've seen from Earth, um, they had picked out. You could have been, you could have been lying on your back looking up, I forget what time of year it was, and if you looked in the, in the vicinity of Buddhist, you would have seen it. It was that bright. Yeah. So, but, um, you know, and what they do, the same sort of thing you do with variable stars, if it's got an afterglow counterpart or even if it's a, just a, you know, a, a gamma, gamma ray or gamma photon source, it's the old you know, intrinsic brightness versus you know, apparent brightness because of how far away it is. And the, only, the other piece you have to consider in this particular case is you know, here's one beam and here's the other. It's, its brightness is somewhat, um, well, it has a lot to do with how directly in the line of sight we are with that particular, that particular jet. So, um, constant study. You know, I, I think it's helpful now. I just would I'd like to get the uh, I'd like to get it out on um, uh, the Novak website. Put a link to it. Uh, but Phil and I talk about it now and then. That I don't follow up. It's just one of those things I'd like to do. Um, does anybody know? Is there any way to get onto these without being a Yahoo member? Can you get to a Yahoo group, or do you have to be a Yahoo member to get to? 
you're limited in what you can see. Yeah. Yeah. And let me go accept guy here, and then we'll we'll put guy on the we'll put guy on the network. Do these scopes make any attempt at calibrating the images before they send them out? They. I noticed in your in your, um, in your series on globular, they seem to be very transparent. Mm -hmm. The whole thing looked like that. Mm -hmm. They do. I haven't figured that out yet in terms of what I'm looking at. Um, they calibrate the scopes um, in the dark. Uh, they have. They all have access to Sloan, you know, typically the Digital Sky Survey, and you know, two masses, the two micron all sky surveys, infrared survey. Those are the two I see the most. That and um, the USNL, um, one of the USNL catalogs. Okay. So does the scope calibrate? Yeah, I'm pretty sure. It does. I, does it? What that means to me, I'm not sure yet. Uh, but when they see a source, and they're looking at different narrowband, you know, uh, filters, they I'm calibrate versus something those. Something like the series you took would do some kind of an empirical calibration, just saying, well, most of the stars in this field should have been the same through the series. Mm -hmm. So let's do a, a rough atmospheric compensation based on that. And then just look at the outliers. Guys now stick around a little bit afterwards if we have time. I'll show you what we get off the um, when I run a job because I don't completely understand yet. It'll show the air mass. It'll show when it's visible above the horizon. You go pick your targets on the basis of a couple of things. When I asked Dan to give me some ideas, I mean it was pretty much pretty close to zenith from that location. It's right on the tip of the N28. It's right on the tip of the teapot, hand, or the top of the top of the teapot. N28 is just about right there. And uh, I mean, from here, you know it's low in the sky. From that part of the world, it's pretty high up Yeah, this time of year. So here's Guy, and I have a choice to reject Guy or approve Guy, so I'm going to approve Guy. Do we vote? <laughs> Too late. I could, I, could, I could take him off, but, you know, I just, but that's how that works. So, um, if you have, I didn't get a piece of paper out, but if you want me to send you an invitation to the site, um, I'll tell you what, I got my observing book here. Just give me your name and your um, email address, and I'll send you a site. And I might send a list out to the, you know, the list server, so be happy to do that. But I, I just, it's, again, it's one of those things, if you're patient and you're willing to you know, see this stuff as it comes through, the main feature is, is um, these messages that swim, that swim through here. Conus Wind, you know that satellite, right? That picks up high energy particles, so sometimes he reports. Um, yeah, and so if it says GCN circulars, it's, it's reported by the ground community. If it says backwardine, and I'll show you one, I don't know what backwardine means, but that's satellite chatter. If we navigate the site on our own, there'll be a join button. Yes. Okay. Um, back backwardine. If you see if you see images that say backwardine, that's chatter off the satellite. I, I don't know what that means, but. Um, I have two sources that come in there for me and all that and the circulars. All right, gang, thank you so much. Okay, good to see you.